aspect of the unit for criticism and interpretive theory. And I'd like to welcome you to the next lecture of the Modern Critical Theory Lecture Series on Structuralism. I'm pleased that so many of you are attending the series, some of you every week and some intermittently. And I appreciate the extra effort that many of you make in joining us from different time zones inside and outside the country. Before we begin, I'll just quickly run through as well the format for this lecture. Professor Martin will be presenting his talk in two segments of roughly 25 minutes uh, with a Q&A session immediately following each segment. Uh, we will be running the discussion through the Q&A feature rather than the chat. So if you'd like to ask a question, please click on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and enter in your questions there. Um, you are welcome to enter your questions in any time during the talk, but Professor Martin will be responding to them at the end of each segment of this talk. I'm del delighted to introduce Professor Jeffrey Martin, who is an Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology and East Asian Languages and Cultures at the University of Illinois here at Urbana-Champaign. He studies policing, in China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and the United States. He's the author of the recently published Sentiment, Reason, and Law, Policing in the Republic of China on Taiwan. This came out in 2019 through Cornell University Press. Before coming to Illinois, he worked at the University of Hong Kong, the Graduate Institute of Taiwan Studies, and Central Police University. He holds a PhD in anthropology from the University of Chicago and a BA in mathematics from the University of Oregon. So welcome to everyone in the audience and a very warm welcome to uh, Professor Martin. And I'm going to hand it over to him um, to get started with the lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Susan. And I first want to just thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. It's really wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed it the last time and um, the unit has been one of my favorite parts of the university since I got here. It's really exciting to be a part of it. it the lectures are great and um, just thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and try to be as professional as I can be given that I'm not very good at Zoom. So please forgive me um, if I make mistakes or look odd. <laughs> um, Today's lecture will be in three parts. Um, I'm going to begin by talking about history. I want to talk about the historical motivations for the uh, ideas of structuralism. And structuralism, as I see it, is a very important intellectual movement within the humanities and the social sciences. In fact, when I think about the history of ideas in sort of a long durée, big picture um, context, I think of structuralism as a high water mark of modernist faith in the mathematical structure of reality. Um, so I'm going to begin by sort of trying to describe that. And then I will move on to the core of the talk, which is um, sort of a quick and dirty introduction to the theory itself, focusing on an, the analytic method, or perhaps better, the the technique at the core of the theory, which can be used at a range of different levels. The idea of a single mathematically based technique of analyzing meaning across different levels that begin with the phonological structure of sound and move up through grammar and narrative into the structure of ritual and social action and perhaps society itself, that idea of a single technique that, that sort of moves so easily across all of those levels seemed when the theory first arrived on the scene, it seemed to promise a sort of grand unified theory of the humanities and social sciences, and perhaps even one that connected it to the natural sciences. So to really understand the historical significance of structuralism in its context, you have to be able to see it with something like the eyes of a child. Um, and really believe with this naive hope and the promise that we have arrived at a sort of final, total mathematical decoding of our world. And now there's not enough time to go through all these different levels, so I'll try to just show you how the technique works at the most basic level of phonology and then at the highest level of, of ritual and mythology. Um, so that will be the, the second part of the lecture. 
Um, and then I'm going to close with a, a counterexample or a, a critical reflection on some problems that happen when we try to objectify subjectivity. And it's a pretty dark counterexample. So just heads up, we're going to talk about some very unpleasant stuff at the end of this lecture. Um, I don't know how to get any sort of cues from, from this machine I'm speaking into. So I'm going to assume that I can just pretend everything is going well. But if, if there's any way to feed back to me, I think probably the earphones are the best way to do it. All right, so um, to begin, uh, structuralism is a modern idea. And by this, I mean that it comes from and it supports a modern idea of a modern ideology of human progress, which is a dream of ever increasing control that we can become the agentive subjects of our own history, capa capable of creating the world in which we live and engineering a life that realizes our potential to make history just as we please. Uh, one iconic figure of this kind of progress towards enlightenment is in the upper left hand corner of my slide, Galileo with his telescope, a new technology that produced new kinds of evidence and to which he applied mathematical reason to construct on this empirical basis a new model of the cosmos that was capable of overturning the received theological models of the universe. The heart of Galileo's theory is the now familiar modern trope that mathematics is the quote, language of nature or the language of God. And if we were giving a summary potted history of modernity, we might uh, identify Galileo as initiating the use of mathematics as the theoretical foundation of a scientific argument that val validated a Copernican cosmology against uh, received theological dogma, an event which set in motion a scientific revolution that was most iconically expressed in Newton's book, The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, published in 1687. And this um, intellectual movement continued full speed ahead until the early part of the 20th century, reaching its kind of final limit in um, this book by Whitehead and Russell called Principia Mathematica, published in 1910. So on this slide, we can see 300 years of undisputed supremacy of mathematical principles in the realm of ideas, uh, sort of tracing out the modern era as a age of secular rationalism and science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And this is not just abstract philosophy. It, in, it gives us practical power. Decoding the mathematical principles of nature empowered us to build technologies which afforded us a kind of mastery over the natural world. The high modernism of the 19th century can be seen in the Tennessee Valley Project to electrify the country, the Hoover Dam of which you see a a sort of iconic statuary on the left, scientific agriculture, planned economies. And in this, the power of this modern mathematical science was taken as evidence of its apparent truth. And say what you will about uh, the idea of planned economies, the progress of science and technology did bring an end to the material poverty that was heretofore a defining aspect of the human condition overall, inaugurating an age when steam or electrical the powered machines produced material conditions which are adequate in potential, if not fact, to support all human beings in circumstances of material plenty. An age in which, in many places, obesity rather than starvation became a sign of poverty. So all of this is sort of prologue and background to the moment of theoretical production that I want to talk about today. And if we want to choose a date to arbitrarily fix our attention on, let us choose 1949, the publication of Claude Lévi-Strauss's book, The Elementary Structures of Kinship. And the immediate context of that book's production was World War II, which was ended by the atom bomb, as we see on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, which uh, shortly led to the production of information theory, which then revolutionized biology through the genetic turn um, unifying it with physics to an unprecedented degree. And this also created the technical foundations for the computer as the mechanical infrastructure of the informational landscape in which we now live. So this was the moment right after the war when a grand unified theory seemed truly imminent. And the idea at the center of this movement can be seen 
sort of running along the bottom of this slide, which is that at the bottom of things, there is a code, a structure that can be decoded. The alchemical transmutation of matter into energy rests on cracking the code of atomic structure. The basis of life itself is a genetic code, and the mediation of our social and cultural life can be carried by information as a code. This is the basic idea of structuralism. So in this sense, the ideology of which structuralism is a piece surrounds us and suffuses our world even into the present. The computer and the gene are examples of concrete facts that support a worldview defined by an idea of a kind of world that is constituted by coding operations. Nature has a code, mathematics is the language of God, information is the basis of the world. So if you want to understand structuralism as a moment in the history of ideas, as a moment in the genealogical development of social theory, uh, it helps to locate it as a piece of this uh, larger story in which physics and the atom as the unit of structure creates the technologies of atomic power. Genetics and the gene as the unit of structure creates technologies of medical engineering. Information theory and the bit as a unit of structure creates the computer, the infrastructure of our contemporary virtual world. So consistent with this general approach to modern scientific thinking, linguistics takes the phoneme as a unit of structure for thinking about how language actually works. And with Levi-Strauss, cultural anthropology takes the so-called mytheme as a unit of structure for thinking about how human social action is organized. So as an anthropologist, I have asked you to read Levi-Strauss as a representative of structuralism. He is not the only structuralist by any means, but he did produce a theory of a structuralist theory of culture that was pretty influential. He lived from 1908 to 2009, and he developed this theory in the 1940s while he was living in New York City as a Jewish refugee from the war in Europe. So he represents the times and the core movement pretty well. Uh, and on the readings, I included an optional selection from his biography, which is quite interesting, um, seeing him as a historical figure living in a time of ferment, an ambitious and driven scholar. He responded to his situation through the methods available to him. The earlier part of his career, he was um, sort of trained as a positivist, positivistic scientific anthropologist who set out on expeditions and practiced collecting. He was an art collector. He spent uh, some time in the field, went on one major field trip, and then returned to the museum, practicing a sort of methodology of natural history, collecting, organizing, and classifying. And so the theoretical work uh, embedded in this approach begins with developing a taxonomy, which then hopefully yields a genealogical sequence of evolutionary development. But of course, the theory of evolution uh, existed long before the gene, and it always begged the question of the unit of selection. Discovery of the gene was prefigured by a search for it. For hundreds of years, people had known there had to be some vector of transmission for inheritance to be possible. What holds things together, what holds time together into a historical or genealogical process is structure the knot in the string through which the string can pass, or the wave in the water. And the basic idea of Levi-Strauss structuralism was that human consciousness could be thought of as the water through which wave forms pass, or the string through which a knot slips, a medium that takes form through structures. Put differently, the basic idea of structuralism was the idea that human consciousness has a code, an an analogous to the way computerized information processing operates by using a code to structure the operations of a computer. So as a project of social theory, uh, the, developing this theory began through a decoding operation. Levi-Strauss organizing his collection, developing a taxonomy, thinking about genealogy, and then the Nazis invaded France. And he ends up in New York where he meets the person, uh, the, the, the person on the left-hand side of the slide, Roman Jakobson, who is a structural linguist and a direct link to Saussure, who we'll talk about in the second part of the lecture. Uh, a direct link to the project begun a generation earlier by the structural linguists who had collected, organized, 
and then decoded the collected work of philologers and deduced from this, from the historical linguistics of the earlier school, the grammatical codes of language. And it's this shift from historical linguistics to structural linguistics that is the true origin of the ideas that we talk about when we talk about structuralism today. So this is the immediate context in which structuralism arose as a potential grand unified theory that would bring the humanities and social sciences into alignment with contemporary developments in physics, biology, and electrical engineering. Splitting the atom, building the bomb, decoding the physical structure of matter, creating a weapon with the potential to destroy the entire planet, and winning the war. Discovering the chemical structure of DNA, the mechanism of inheritance, and beneath both of those, the emergence of a new kind of mathematics, information theory, reverse entropy, the definition of life, the basis of computer codes, biology, and linguistics. It's, it's no wonder that they thought it was perhaps the key to the meaningful dimension of the world itself. So that's the historical context and the whole purpose there was to try to make you feel the wonder of a naive child who, who has just confronted the possibility that perhaps the code of everything has been cracked. Now let us look at what proposed to be that code cracking technique. Let us look at the actual technique of structuralism beginning with phonology. So this uh, is a picture on the right-hand side of Saussure with his wonderful mustache. And on the left, we have his diagram of a so-called speech situation, which is the situation we are in right now, although there is a computer right down the middle of those dotted lines uh, on, the, on the diagram. Now, the, the speech situation is two people making noise with their mouth, which goes into the, their interlocutor's ear, is mediated by their brain, and produces a response out of their mouth. The content of Saussurean linguistics was um, structuralism as a modernist answer to the question, what is language? We begin with the speech situation and we ask the question, what is language? And now the answer to this question is, <clears throat> Language is not speech. <laughs> this is a radical statement. We are in a speech situation here. What is happening? There is a lot of noise happening. You are listening to my noise. You are hearing my noise and you are getting my meaning. Hearing words and getting meaning is, is language, but this actual noisy thing that is happening here is not language. Language is not speech. Language is not the actual physical noises that a person makes. Now I want to think about this for a moment. What does it mean to say this, that language is not speech? And now I'm going to demonstrate. It's always a little embarrassing. But what it means is that is not meaningful. Everything about that is identical to speech, except for one thing. Is noise that lacks language. Language is not speech. Language is what makes the difference between and meaningful speech. Language is a virtual structure that exists as the condition of possibility for speech. What this means is that the theory of structuralism begins by postulating the existence of a virtual dimension, which can be placed, mapped on a piece of paper as orthogonal or perpendicular to the timeline. There is a so-called paradigmatic axis on which we can plot the set of meaningful distinctions in sound that allow you to hear words. That is the idea at the beginning of structuralism. Our experience, our experience of meaning when we hear words, our experience, which is in time, it's always in time, we are in time, our historical experience of meaning, our historical experience of meaningful speech is not itself language. That experience is something made possible by a virtual structure that we call language. And likewise, our historical experience of meaning itself is not culture, but something made possible by a virtual structure that we will call culture. 
what actually happens in time and space is not the thing that we want to study if we are structuralist cultural anthropologists. Historical experience, that which actually happens in time, is made possible by a virtual structure that exists somehow outside of time as a condition of possibility for the way we experience time. So how does this actually work? Well, phonology is relatively clear. When somebody speaks, vibrations are made by their body and they travel through air or through electrical circuits, but they end up as vibrations in the body of the hearer. Their sound moves and their sound moves in time along a timeline, changing into different shapes. So this is a picture on my screen here of the um, sound love. Love, you are diagramming the vibrations of matter that make the sound love. The sounds of love are different than the sounds leave. That's why I love you is different from I leave you because the sound uh is different from the sound e. And that is what a phoneme is. A phoneme is the unit of distinction at the level of sound that makes a difference at the level of meaning. A phoneme is the unit of oral difference that makes a meaningful difference. And if you want to diagram all the phonemes in a language, you can make them, you can describe them as base pairs, as things that make a difference, right? Like love and leave. Or here, these phonetic diagrams show you the vibrations of sound that make the difference between fe and say which is a significant contrast between two phonemes in the English language. Learning English is the process of learning to perceive and produce these phonetic distinctions. Learning a language is about mastering the virtual structure of distinct distinctions that allows you to process noise as words. This virtual structure that you master is language. So this is Saussure's basic um, contribution to phonology. Our historical experience of meaningful speech is made possible by a virtual structure that exists outside of time. That is what I've just described to you on this little graph of the syntagmatic axis of time and the paradigmatic axis of virtual structure. And this is the basic idea of structuralism. Our historical experience of meaning is made possible by a virtual structure that exists outside of time. So as a theory or a method, structuralism gives us a way to approach questions about the meaningful dimension of human experience. And there are a number of different interesting observations we can make if we look at the world through this lens. For example, these structures of virtual distinction that allow us to perceive meaning are ultimately arbitrary. They are instituted as social facts entirely by conventional agreements between the people that share them. And the, one of the ways that they work is by conditioning our experience um, as distinctions, as love not leave, hopefully, <laughs> in which we perceive what something is by contrast to what it's not. You love me because you're not leaving me which is to say the identity of an object is constituted by the absent presence of alternative possibilities. So the key to analyzing the operation of these conventional structures of distinction is by focusing on binary oppositions, the base pairs of phonetic contrast, the difference between a uh and e, or f and s, or as we will get to later, the founding oppositions of mythological reason things like the difference between male and female, or hot and cold. Let us now um, focus on something called a sign. Uh, and think about how studying signs enables a science that we call semiology. In Saussure's formulation, a sign looks much like a football being tossed back and forth in the speech situation, in the sense that it's an ovally shaped diagram with a line down the middle. The line is important. It's the connection between two things. That was a joke, by the way. Um, 
the connection is between the signified and the signifier. And the connection between those two things is the most important thing about a sign. The line in the middle of that diagram of a sign, the thing that connects the signified to the signifier is an associative bond. It holds two things together that is, are only held together by the capacity of the human psychological mechanism to hold things together like that. In each case, it's completely arbitrary and conventional. It is a social fact, right? So what makes um, love attached to the idea of love the, signify, the signifier of the sound of the word attached to the meaning of the word, the signified, is this associative bond. And it's completely conventional. There's no reason why that sound should have that meaning. That's an example of the arbitrariness of the sign or the arbitrariness of that associative bond. And that is one of the most important ideas distinguishing social science from natural science. The entire domain of signification has this arbitrary, conventional, and therefore historically instituted, historical, relationship to the quote-unquote real world. Um, this model of the sign and the idea of semiology as the science of signs is what allows structuralism to appear as a grand unified theory connecting the basic mechanisms of spoken communication all the way up through these various layers of complexity to the ultimate cosmic meaning of life, the universe, and everything. We can go from phonology and we can see how there can be minimal units of noise that make a difference at the level of meaning. Then we can go up to the level of grammar and see how there are minimal different minimal distinctions at the level of micro meaning that make a difference at the level of macro meaning. And then we can go up to the level of narrative and see how there are differences in macro meaning that make a level, make a difference at the level of plot. And then we can go from there and see how different modes of plot make a difference at the level of like cosmological ultimate experiences of the way the universe is put together. For example, <coughs> we have here are here are three signs. The, the structure of the sign in each case is the same, a signifier and a signified connected by an associative bond, but the top right is the, how the, the, the sound vibrations mean say as opposed to fe. And then the, in the middle, we have how the sounds k -at, the three phonemes k -at, are connected to the idea of a cat. And then at the bottom, we have the idea of a cat as connected to uh, the per Bastet, the perfumed protector. <laughs> so a science of signs based on the methodology of structural analysis would seem to be a very promising way to make sense, sense out of things in general. But this begs some questions. Specifically, it begs the question of this idea that something exists outside of time. Structure exists outside of time. Human beings exist inside of time. Everything about us is temporal, is historical. So how do we really understand the connection between what exists outside of time, the structural dimension, and what exists inside of time? And especially when we move away from the very concrete analysis of noise being converted into words and start to think about experience in general, as something that can also be experienced not as noise, not as just static and a void of meaninglessness, but as an intensely meaningful qualitative world. How are we gonna make sense out of where this virtual structure is and how it gets from wherever it is outside of time into time? <clears throat> this is where um, Levi-Strauss comes in. Levi-Strauss is the person who gives us the idea of the mythene. Phonemes are fundamental units of meaningful sound. If you want to learn a language, you train your, your body to make those phonemes and you train your ears to hear those phonemes. By analogy to that, Levi-Strauss asks us, what are the fundamental units of meaningful experience in general? What is it that we train our consciousness to recognize this, that is analogous to the way we perceive meaning in noise that allows us to perceive meaning in our experience. 
And I don't have any idea what time it is, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second and assume that it has been about 30 minutes. Yes, it has. Okay. <laughs> You're exactly on track. So. Oh, thank God. Um, so do you, do you want to shift now, um, Jeff, to Q&A? Maybe we can open that up. Yeah, let's do that. That's great. Okay. So, um, yeah. So um, if you, those of you who have questions, just type it into the Q&A uh, function, and then we will, uh, what I'll do is I'll be reading it out, and then um, Jeff will respond. This usually takes a little bit of time, so just allow you that. No problem. The long, awkward silence is one of the keys to effective Zoom uh, <laughs> interaction, I think. Okay, so we have the first question, and this is from Amelia. Um, and she asks, I want to know how structuralism approaches gendered speech. If a specific word, say in Italian or Spanish, is gendered female, is this gendered tie seen as an arbitrary bond? Yes. <laughs> um, everything is arbitrary. So every bond is arbitrary at the level of the connection between the signified and the signifier. In the domain of the structural relationship between all the things that are signified, you start to get relationships of, of necessity or, or this idea that all things gendered female are therefore similar in being female. So something that's gendered female would have lots of female attributes. So you get this analogical pressure, it's called, to, um, for, for things, once they're placed into a structural system at some level through this, this arbitrary, um, arbitrariness, they, 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 they are exposed to forces of meaning that, that are contained in the structural logic at that level if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's a really interesting kind of comment about something similar um, by the um, writer Yoko Tawada, and she writes in Japanese as well as in German. And she talks about the experience of learning German and struggling really hard with dealing with gendered kind of uh, pronouns. Totally, yes. You know, and she said that I, I, I'm, you know, now that you're sort of talking about it in this context, it's perhaps exactly that arbitrariness of, of the gendering that I think she found very difficult because she started learning German as, um, an, uh, as an adult fairly late in her totally, 20s. So, totally. yeah. Okay, we have another question. Oh, lots of questions. So, okay. um, this one is from Dee Dee Ruggles. Um, and uh, the question is, could you address forms of signification that occur outside of language? Written words, uh, nonverbal sounds, images, gestures, perhaps less easy. Um, yeah. So this is such a beautiful segue to the next section. I mean, Levi-Strauss is about trying to put everything into this model, including gesture and, and, and it, everything is, you know, just the, the universe is like, radiating meaning at all times. We are sort of, everything is endowed with meaning through this, this way of thinking about things. Um, and gesture is wonderful. I, I had a, a, a classmate in graduate school who did his dissertation on sign language storytelling. And so that was a, a place where bodily gesture and the aesthetics of communication were, were just so deeply fused. It, it brought this really interesting reflection on how all communication is sort of full spectrum <laughs> communication. Um, so that's a great question. And I think you'll be happy with the next part of the talk. <laughs> um, uh, this question is from Alexis Webb. Um, and she says, I can't shake the thought that structuralism is only serving those who are neurotypical. Can this theory of language apply to populations such as those with Alzheimer's, low-functioning intellectual disabilities, those who are nonverbal? 
I think that's an accurate statement. I don't think it applies. I mean, it's a very specific statement about what it, it starts with a theory of what language is. So a being that does not exist in language would essentially be outside of this domain of phenomena. So, so I think that's, that's true. Um, the next question is from Jin He Lee. How does this theory affect or how does this theory affect or not affect your analysis of contemporary China? This is a huge question. Yeah, well, I mean, you can't really be a structuralist anymore for the reasons like, I mean, it's, it's a, it's too, like, I try to set it up as like, this is the answer to everything at the beginning of the talk. And then by the end of the talk, I'm going to say like, be careful. <laughs> this is sort of like really powerful stuff that can go wrong really easily. So, um, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't think theoretically without thinking post structures structurally. <laughs> so it, 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 it's, um, everything I do is, um, somehow related to having learned this at some point. <laughs> okay. Um, Sasha McDowell. How would structuralism approach the fact that some languages have different genders for the same noun? That is, in Russian versus Ukrainian, they have two different genders for the word moon. I mean, that's exactly the, the kind of thing that a, a structuralist would get really excited about and spend a whole lot of time trying to understand what does this say about the world that this virtual structure of distinctions that allow people to experience meaning what does it what does it say about what their experience of meaning is that the moon is sometimes male and sometimes female or or maybe has a third gender or i mean there is absolutely no limit to the complexity and um poetry that can be developed through s s cultural structures they're arbitrary you can literally make anything <laughs> you want sort of yeah. um from sophie jen I don't know if this is relevant, but it reminds me of how Chinese characters are constructed as pictograms. Like the character pregnant, mm. Yun, um, it, uh, it just describes a woman bearing a child. Yes, it's like the ideographic representations versus purely um, phonetic representations are a really interesting thing to compare and contrast. And I don't, I mean, I think Chinese has, I don't think it's possible to have a completely ideographic representation of speech, of language, because you, you can develop abstract concepts that are just, you know, you can talk about things that are very hard to draw pictures of. <laughs> um, but that, that is a really interesting part of, of Chinese. Um, and the last question, it looks like from Aubrey Powell. Is structuralism an idea that originate, originated specifically in the field of cultural anthropology? Not at all. Um, I mean, there is a kind of structuralism that's associated with anthropology, and Claude Lévi-Strauss is kind of the iconic figure of that, but um, he was stealing, borrowing ideas from linguistics primarily. And, and before he, I mean, there were other people sort of developing s structuralist theories of psychology and stuff um, I think slightly before his, you know, his elementary structures of kinship, which is like his defining statement of that idea. Um, we have a little more time if anyone has questions. Otherwise. You know, my, my talk might run just a little long. Oh, okay. Um, so should we? Yeah. Yeah. So if we can, if I can, I'll feel really I'll feel better when I'm done. Okay. <laughs> it's easier okay. to answer questions. So maybe we'll carry over some of that time uh, for the end then. Okay. Um, okay, right. so let's continue and then okay, uh, come back to the Q&A at the very end. Um, so I will share my screen again and talk about Levi-Strauss on mythology. So can we use this um, technique of analysis that's so clear when you apply it to phonology to create a theory of um, human experience in general, not just the way we experience noise as meaningful speech, but the way our experience of the world is of a world as a meaningful, qualitatively rich 
thing that has all sorts of, you know, values uh, in it that are sort of, you know, would appear to be part of our human um, experience specifically. So Levi Strauss said yes to this. He thought that this was definitely um, something to do, something that we could develop a, a method of understanding. And in order to do this, where lingu linguists work with language and speech, Levi Strauss got very interested in myths. Myths are shared stories that don't have any individual author. They just seem to show up and be there, you know, as sort of some sort of historical legacy. And they also seem to typically invoke deep archetypes or foundational meanings. So to understand um, Levi-Strauss's structural analysis, although he started out with kinship, in his later part of his career, he got very interested in myths. So in order to sort of describe how he analyzes that, um, the reading I assigned, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how he analyzed a particular myth and the form of ritual practice that was structured by that myth. But first, to sort of back up and review, where Saussure invented structuralism as a way of answering the question, what is language? We might take Levi-Straussian anthropology as proposing structuralism as a modernist answer to the question, what is culture? One that is modeled directly on the way Saussure addressed the question of what is language, that is, culture is a virtual structure that supplies a condition of possibility for the meaningfulness of human experience. Language is not speech. Language is the virtual structure of distinction that allows us to experience noise as words. Culture is not experience. Culture is a meaningful structure of distinctions that allows us to experience life as meaningful. Now, how would we actually develop a model of such a thing like that? The first order of business is to identify the fundamental units. The brilliance of phonology, the breakthrough, came in identifying the phoneme as a unit, the minimal difference in sound that makes a difference in meaning, binary units of contrast in sound that make differences at the level of meaning. As we move up from phonology through all the stuff that I've skipped over to get to myth, morphology, lexemes, stuff, grammatical structures, it gets considerably more complicated to determine what the unit of analysis is. What is a coherent morphological unit? Okay, that's not that hard. It's a syllable. Now, what is a coherent lexical unit? When do we decide that something is a word? That actually turns out to be relatively complicated. There isn't a really obvious answer to that. And we're, we're way, we're several orders of abstraction above just the word when we're talking about mythemes. So we have to sort of um, st stretch the model just a little bit to try to think about binary units of contrast in meaning that would provide a sort of fundamental ground for the way we experience the meaningfulness in the world. Like just as p and b are a phonetic difference that makes possible the lexical distinction between pat and bat, up and down, left and right, male and female, we might think of those as a kind of set of fundamental distinctions that allow us to make differences between left-wing high-class women and right-wing low-class men, or something like that, right? In any case, just like Saussure's phonemes, these mythical contrasts, these mythemes, would be arbitrary and conventional structures of association that would sit at the very bottom of our experience, or rather, beneath the bottom of our experience, outside of our experience, right? As a virtual structure of distinction that we somehow learned just like we learn a language, we learn to structure, to organize, to filter our perception through because we have to, because that's the condition of possibility for making sense out of our experience. So the, 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 the method or the theory that Levi-Strauss wants to give us is, is how do we go about discerning such a mythical grammar? So I'm going to talk about an example, which is presented on page 48 through 51 of the readings. And it's about a group of people called the Hidatsa, which is part of the Sioux 
uh, peoples who lived northwest of where we are now. And they had a practice of eagle hunting, which according to the sources that Levi-Strauss consulted, this involved digging a hole and hiding in it, putting some sort of bait on the top, and then waiting in that hole until an eagle flew down and took the bait. And then very quickly grabbing the eagle and capturing it. And then ideally the hunter would take a live eagle back to their camp and show it off to everyone else, take a few feathers and let it go. It's kind of a strange and remarkable thing to do. It's certainly not an economic use of time. And yet <clears throat> it does appear to be very meaningful, very compelling. People find this an intensely meaningful thing to do. So that sounds, that, that is exactly the kind of thing that a structural analyst of the mythical structure of human experience would want to take as data. Here is a form of human practice that carries a lot of meaning. Let's figure out what the virtual structure of distinctions is that makes those meanings possible. Culture is not the practice. Culture is the virtual structure of distinctions that allows spending days lying in a hole in the ground, trying to catch a live eagle to be a peak experience, to be incredibly meaningful. How would we illuminate the structural basis of the mythemes that make this a cultural practice? Well, then Levi-Strauss mobilizes all the stories he can find about this practice, all the myths, all the sort of lore, all the tradition. And he notes, he says, well, apparently these people say that they were taught how to do this by a kind of spiritual animal, which Levi-Strauss identifies as being a wolverine. And then he says the wolverine is a very important symbolic animal because it embodies a number of paradoxes. And this is where structural analysis really starts to get traction at the level of like cosmology. It's in the paradox or the embodied paradox. It's in these things that seem to sit in the middle or mediate between the binary oppositions of the structure of virtual distinctions that are the condition of possibility for meaningful experience. It's, the, it's, it's like the world makes sense from a certain point of view. The, 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 that point of view, the perspective is what holds it all together. And the human being has to constantly be working to sort of find the line between the binary dimensions of the world. So in the interest of saving some time so that I can I'm cutting out just a small bit, which is like reading you all of the um, descriptions in the book on page 50 and 51 of this myth. Instead, I'm going to summarize them and assume that you read them, or if you're interested, you will read them. Um, the, the idea is that this experience is so meaningful because it mediates between the hunter and the hunted. The wolverine is an animal that steals bait from traps, right? It is an animal that, the, that actually hunts the hunter. And so that's why it's such a feature of this particular ritual. And then the, the distinction between the, the eagle soaring up high and the hunter being down low and the hunter being in a, ground, in a hole in the ground and the eagle being in the sky is another dimension of the meaningful universe that is sort of brought together and mediated by this. And then the use of the bait, it's like dead old bait. It's bloody, disgusting bait, um, which is normally considered to be a problem. But in this particular situation, it's, the meaning is inverted. And, and so the tension between bloodiness and cleanliness is another one of these oppositions that appears to be indicating this virtual structure of distinctions outside of time that makes this a meaningful experience. It's, a, it's kind of a stretch. You're trying to apply this method that works so well in phonology to something very different. But it, it's sort of, this is how we get the idea that we have looked at a ritual and we're starting to discern a mythical structure that is the condition of possibility for this form of practice to be very intensely meaningful.
And the basic method is to try to identify fundamental binary distinctions, differences that make a difference, just like the phonemes or differences in, the, in sound that make a difference at the level of meaning. We're trying to find differences in symbols that make a difference at the level of experience. And then we diagram them as a system of distinctions <coughs> that reveal to us some of the meaningful structure of a world. And the theory here is that culture is, right? Language is not speech. Language is a condition of possibility for speech. Culture is not experience. Culture is a condition of possibility for experience. Culture is the structure of distinctions, which constitutes a point of view from which human life can take shape as a qualitative experience in a qualitative world. The world is a meaningful order because of this virtual structure of distinctions that exists outside of time and make it possible for people to experience hiding in a hole in the ground for several days as really um, intense and, and, and like a really positive experience. So <laughs> if you sort of think about this mathematically now, mythemes are dimensions of meaning. Given a meaningful experience, like this eagle hunting ritual of the Hidatsa, the question becomes how many different dimensions of meaningfulness do we need to diagram in order to locate that experience as a coherent thing within a space of meaningful possibilities? And if you are interested in mathematics, this is a, this is a form of like multivariate algebra. The question of, if, you've, if you have an object that has an unknown number of dimensions, how do you determine the base, all of the different basic dimensional vectors that create the space in which that object exists? And of course, the, the, the spaces that we're most familiar with is like actual physical space, which has three dimensions. With, with width, height, and depth, you can, all physical objects exist in that three-dimensional space. Human beings also sometimes talk about time as being a dimension, right? So we have the three dimensions of our physical being, and then we have this fourth dimension of like what my body was five seconds ago and what it's going to be in 10 years, right? And so you, have a, you can see that diagrammed on the slide here as a, as a way of thinking about dimensions, right? And you could have infinite dimensional spaces in a purely mathematical sense. So this form, of, this form of like analyzing this ritual is a way of trying to take this observed actual practice and then create a hypothesis about the virtual structure of distinctions that made it meaningful by presuming it exists in a three-dimensional space of its huntedness, like the hunter-hunted binary, its height and depth binary, like in a hole in the ground flying in the sky, and then it's bloody clean binary. So we, we start to get this feeling like, oh, now we're learning the language. Now we're learning the actual structure of experience that motivates this form of practice as a meaningful human enterprise. It gives us a way to map the point of view, right? The so-called native's point of view from which this observed behavior, this observed ritual, can be, we, can, we can understand it as a compelling way to commune with the fundamental structure of meaningful life. And so if we really wanted to understand the Hidatsa as a group, we might try to collect as many different forms of ritualized practice as possible and try to develop a complete map of the n-dimensional space of possible meanings for a person living in that culture. And that would presumably be an accurate model of their cultural worldview. <clears throat> so this is where we start to get these really elaborate diagrams of sort of like cultural structures. You know, what are this, the, the total base pairs that define an, a, a multidimensional space of possible meanings that is the structure of distinctions that people are actually using to experience their lives as meaningful. Um, so this leads us then to sort of like the last issue that Levi-Strauss gives us a way 
to think about, which is how do these mythical structures actually exist in time? How do we learn language? How do we learn culture? And how is culture sustained and reproduced through human practice? Now, the whole purpose of this structural analysis of myth themes is exactly parallel to the linguist's project of describing language as an abstract structure of virtual distinctions, which makes noise into meaningful speech. Um, it's this project of describing culture as an abstract structure of virtual distinctions, which creates a point of view from which the world can appear as a meaningful whole. We learn to see through this structure of distinction by hearing stories, by hearing myths, by engaging in rituals, or by engaging with art that reflects and concentrates the mythical logic of the world in a kind of miniature or microcosm. And this is the chapter about bricolage and engineering and how this is the question of how um, structure reproduces, is reproduced in time. Um, so we presumably people learn culture the same way they learn language. Culture and language are both virtual structures that provide the condition of possibility for human beings to experience their existence as meaningful. When you see things from a given point of view, we're always inside culture, just as our thoughts, once we become linguistic, are always inside language. Um, when you see things from a given cultural point of view, the world you see is absolutely compelling, but the terms themselves are arbitrary. They don't have any intrinsic significance. The meaning of the specific highly meaningful things that people experience are created by their position within the structure, a function of the history and cultural context on the one hand and the structural system in which they're called to appear on the other. My lecture notes now have a bunch of quotes from Levi-Strauss. So <laughs> I'm ventriloquating someone else's words here. <clears throat> the semantic position <clears throat> of an element like bees, which he discusses in a system of meaning is configured by these axes of distinction, right? These binary base pairs, say water, land, air, flying, crawling, sweet, spicy. The bee has no intrinsic meaning on its own. It's just a position in a space of meaningful distinctions, the basis of which is essentially arbitrary. It is the form of the space that matters to the meanings of the elements it contains, not the content of the symbols. So this is a direct argument against the Jungian idea that there are mythical archetypes that are sort of fundamental truths to the human condition generated by our psyche. No, these are all learned just the way we learn language. Quote, the principle underlying a classification can never be postulated in advance. It can only be discovered a posteriori by ethnographic investigation, or which is to say ex by experience. Um, so we, I mean, it's just like structural linguistics. But here's the point, sorry, I'm... Um, <laughs> Structure is this virtual thing that exists outside of time. And this raises the question of how it relates or fits into the historical quality of human life. This kind of question can be asked at the level of individual human experience, which is deeply historical, as well as about the obvious historical dimension of the kinds of things that anthropologists want to know about the world at the level of sort of collective shared cultural ideas. And here is where in the book, we see reference to cybernetic feedback loops and system theory ideas about homeostatic equilibrium at the level of structure. And we, we see an explicit discussion of synchrony and diachrony, which is the question of how events might destabilize a structure. How do structures survive the, the chaos of an event? <clears throat> For example, to totems, there are worlds that are organized by the totemic identities of the different kinds of people in the world, the wolf clan and the, 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 the last airbender, right? The fire tribe and the water tribe, etc. Well, how would a world like that survive if all the members of one totem died? What would happen then? The structure would be broken. There wouldn't be anything left to carry it forward. This is where Levi-Strauss says, like a motor with a feedback device governed by its previous harmony, the tensions within the system will push disorganization towards reorganization. 
And this is how institutions, though born along on the flux of time, manage to steer a course between the contingencies of history and the immutability of design. So this is not like this, the idea that stru the structure agency problem, the idea that, okay, if there are virtual structures of distinction that are the condition of possibility for our experience, how can our experience ever be anything but a reproduction of structures? He actually has an answer for this. And um, the answer at the level of individual practice is through this concept of bricolage. It's a word he uses, which means sort of improvisational practice. It's a kind of creative playfulness that is made possible by the fact that the structural dimension of human life is always basically falling apart. We're, we live more in the debris of structure than the actual structures themselves. To talk about this, Levi-Strauss proposes that magic and science are two distinct modes of doing the same thing. That thing is the drive to organize our experience into a meaningful structure, to make sense out of our lives. The difference is that one, magic, is roughly adapted to the level of perception and the imagination. The other, science, is at a move, as a, at an abstract sort of willful attempt to get above the level of perception and the imagination. So then he starts to talk about how this human tendency to make sense of our lives or our sustained commitment to the aestheticization of experience accumulates or generates a cultural tradition as a memory bank. We have a sort of collective memory bank ambient in the cultural resources of the world we're born into. People engage with this memory bank through what he calls the science of the concrete, bricolage. It's a kind of um, tinkering, hacking, playing around with, right? Remixing, craftiness. And this is how people really do engage with myths and rites. It's much less, like sort of a full dress orthodox ritual is less common than a, a half improvised ritual. All behavior is sort of continually half improvised rituals. Levi-Strauss describes the logic or the attitude of bricolage by contrast to engineering as follows. An engineer begins with an end in mind and then creates a project to realize that end. By contrast, a bricolure just starts with whatever is on hand and plays with it and sees what she can make out of them. It's not the project, it's the play. It's just making music, it's just jamming, it's just looking in the refrigerator and seeing what you could make for dinner. So this is a really interesting way to think about allegorical storytelling within the genre of fan fiction. The characters from a pop cultural world become available as a medium through which people can play with the project of making sense out of experience, right? What would Jesus do? Is this going to put me on the naughty list? Levi-Strauss talks about this in terms of Saucerian signs, links between images and concepts. But he talks about the, the difference between a pure concept and a sign. A pure concept is like a philosophical abstraction or a scientific concept. This is the attempt to purify meaning from entanglement in the messy debris of the historical world. Signs, by contrast, are pre-constrained by the contextual implications they carry. They're historically acquired baggage. So if you want to, as in this movie, The Rise of the Guardians, tell a story through the figures of Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy, you are using those figures in a way that capitalizes on all the historical baggage that is carried by those figures by the fact that everyone has grown up with them as culturally available um, signs. So true, Jesus Christ is a figure freighted with all kinds of baggage, but pure concepts like benevolence or rebirth um, can be used to try to get out of the world of messy historical signs and access a, a sort of transcendent level of structural meaning. So um, bricolage is playing around with Santa Claus and the Christ child to create an interesting story. Engineering is doing a pure philosophy of benevolence. The quote by Levi-Strauss, the engineer is trying to make his way out of and go beyond the constraints imposed by a particular state of civilization, while the 
while the bricoleur, by inclination or necessity, always remains inside, within that particular state of civilization. The engineer works with concepts, the bricoleur with signs. Um, Analogical reasoning through a thick field of cultural signification, carrying messages which have, to some sense, been transmitted in advance. When you tell a story about Santa Claus and the Christ child, you can't expect people not to read a lot of pre-given meanings into these figures. So um, this is where he, 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 he sort of says, as living in worlds figured through this process of bricolage, is a process of creativity through a kind of shattering of the given plot in order to recompose a new plot out of the fragments of the past, building ideological castles out of the debris of what was once a social discourse. I think that's a pretty clear, I hope that's a pretty clear description. Now I'm going to shift a little bit to some very dark and depressing topics. Um, I don't know, it seems like the most effective way to communicate, and so I'm going to do it. The first time I, I put this lecture together was several years ago. And just as I was putting it together, a friend of mine suffered a terrible tragedy when her husband died, and they had six-year-old twins at the time. And I remember Christmas that year was coming, and there was just this ominous dread about how to build from the debris of that event, a new ideological engagement with this obligatory ritual that's just coded into the time of our society in a way that would somehow make it possible for that family to go on. And, and that's, I mean, bricolage is a very serious undertaking. And with, with that level of sort of um, gravitas, I, I now want to, tell you a, a story of how this promising idea that we can crack the code of meaningful human experience has produced utter atrocity in the world we live in today. As a warning to anyone that feels like there's a real promise there to transcend um, certain limitations on the human experience. So, I mean, it's sort of like, a, I guess hubris is the the, the problem here, modern hubris. So we split the atom, we cracked the code, life is pure information, reverse entropy, and now with this structuralism, we can finally bring difficult questions about the meaningful existence, the meaning of our existence under the, this decoding technique of scientific technology. As bricolage, as improvisation, as muddling through, okay, that's fine. Let's see what we can make of this human capacity for meaning. But as engineering, as the idea that we can begin with the end of mind and then by will find our way to that end, that can create tremendous problems. Science enables technology and technology solves some problems, technical problems, but there are problems at the level of human beings that are not technical and trying to apply technical solutions to those problems can actually amplify them. So this is a parallel story. It takes place at exactly the same sort of time frame that structuralism was enjoying its efflorescence in the social sciences and humanities, but it takes place in a different part of the, um, you know, industrial academic complex. What does it mean when people see psyche as a machine? Now, if you read the, the, the two optional readings about Levi-Strauss's life and the theory and this book on the information by James Gleick, which is a, the history of information theory, you will meet this fellow Norbert Wiener, who is at the very center of that entire story. Norbert Wiener was a, a genius engineering professor at MIT who invented cybernetics. And you can see the book on the left is called Control and Communication in the Animal and the Machine. And he's pictured there with the machine and then a much more chilling title, The Human Use of Human Beings. Norbert Wiener joined the war effort in World War II um, very fervently. He was very um, 
anti-fascist, you might say. And he tried to build an anti-aircraft predictor machine. This is prior to computers. This was a mechanical device that supposedly, if you could track an airplane for 15 or 20 seconds and then fire a gun, it would take six seconds for the, for the projectile to reach the airplane. And you had to predict where the, where the pilot would go in that six seconds. So this was an attempt to model human behavior mechanically. He organized a team to do this, and they each took a small piece of the problem of the puzzle, and they would create their little circuit with its feedback loops, and they would have well-defined inputs and outputs, but they wouldn't need to communicate with each other on how they'd actually solve that problem. So they put all the circuitry together, and then they encased it in a box that they had lying around in the basement of MIT. Those were all happened to be black, so they called them black boxes. And the idea of a black box is something you don't need to understand, but you can know its inputs and outputs became a very important part of systems theory. And we see this kind of language in uh, the Levi-Strauss selection. The human psyche can be thought of as a black box. For example, our contemporary surveillance capitalism architecture treats the human psyche as a black box. We use data mining and pattern recognition to track big data and figure out, hey, when we change this input, we can change this output. We don't know what's happening in the process in between, but we can make money. This kind of thinking is continuous with a theory of behaviorism and psychic engineering that produced something called brainwashing. And on the right, we see a picture of Pavlov uh, showing a dog. And Pavlov didn't just realize that dogs will drool when you ring a bell if you feed them every time. He actually autopsied dogs and figured out that the brain was electrical. And so this idea that the brain is an electrical machine feeds into a, a, a sort of a, a separate trajectory of intellectual history about how you can instrumentalize forms of influence at the level of psyche. So this, these are books from around World War I, before World War I, World War I actually. Edward Bernays was a Sigmund Freud's nephew and the father of public relations and advertising in, in America. And he was um, involved in the, the peace of World War I, trying to um, do the propaganda operations to um, convince all the powers in Europe to accept the American terms of the peace. So this is a, this, this um, strand of the genealogy converges with the anthropological story right after World War II in something called the Macy Conferences, which Norbert Wiener organized and in which Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead met with Claude Shannon and the, the architects of information theory. And all of this stuff that I talked about was really centrally um, cross-fertilizing. And then the, the Levi-Straussian version of cultural anthropology goes off in its direction, but this sort of idea that there's a way to operationalize this, not for just a bricolage of like seeing what we can do with this here, but for something like a military engineering project of creating outcomes. And the idea of brainwashing enters disc, the um, English language <coughs> After the, uh, during the Korean War. It's a Chinese term that was translated into English and then packaged into this salacious um, sort of uh, quasi-academic quasi um, enterprise of stirring up panic, moral panics around the idea that there's an instrument that can be, that can actually capture the black box mechanism of the human psyche and um, create ends that are imposed by the engineer. And this then becomes extremely useful for domestic politics through the idea that the communists have a brainwashing mechanism and there's an enemy within. And the important thing, of course, is to close the brainwashing gap. And that's when the CIA decides that they better come up with their own forms of brainwashing and they um, start to do things like invent LSD and spread it around and fund the, um, a, lot of, a lot of sort of activity that um, 
produces things like the Unabomber, that's Ted Kaczynski there, who was one of the victims of the experimentation with LSD through the project MK Ultra. Um, which, so, so all of this, like this idea of the black box and the cybernetic machine, and the, there's some sort of structural mechanism that can be engineered inside the human skull, produced first uh, this idea that the, that, um, the American military apparatus would get their own version of this. It also produced this tr survive, evade, resist, and escape training within the army, which was supposed to design people to resist brainwashing. But of course, when the army decided to, or when this, the military um, actors decided to try to create brainwashing, they simply reversed the the valence on all of those techniques and they created the forms of brutality and torture that we saw in the first Gulf War. And they, um, the final sort of conclusion here is that when we see psyche as a machine and we think that we can decode the experience of a human being in a way that opens that up to an engineered solution where we can link one black box to another black box in a series that creates a mechanism that produces a determined end. We put ourselves into a situation where the actual literal black box shows up in a Chicago police station that's run by this guy here, John Burge, who learned how to do torture in Vietnam as a military policeman and brought it back to Chicago and used it to attempt to produce confessions to crimes that people hadn't committed. So I just, um, that is the end of my talk. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. And, um, and I'll take your questions. Well, we have a question already, so maybe we'll start with this one. Okay. This is from uh, Sambhavi uh, Kosh, um, and it is, um, and I'll give you time to drink water because you've been talking continuously. Um, how do we use structuralism to understand ideas such as the primordial sound, Om, in Hindu philosophy or in the Svota theory? That's a very specific question. Yes. Wow. Um, well, I don't know. I think it would probably be very interesting to try. Structuralism is a, I mean, structuralism is a really seductive idea that seems to promise to solve everything and doesn't. Levi Strauss, the, the end of his life was spent in this amazing workshop that had all the myths of the world organized in these filing cabinets. Like he'd, he had tried to collect every myth in, in ever recorded in the human experience, and he was trying to do something with it. And it was just like, what do you do with this? You know, it didn't, it didn't actually produce enlightenment or, or transcendence or anything. So, um, maybe the primordial sound would just, just go with the primordial sound and forget <laughs> the structuralism there. <laughs> okay, um, the next question is from um, Soumya Dasgupta. Thank you so much for the comprehensive talk. Um, you mentioned that according to Levi Strauss, myths seem to appear and have no distinct author. However, Roland Barth in my understandings, talks about myths generating in, emerging or generating mm. in particular political contexts. I want to know whether myths are treated differently by Barth and Levi Strauss. What, what would that suggest if we are to investigate relationships between the myth, the author slash non-author, and meaning? That's a great dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. I, I don't, I'm not a Barth scholar, so I would not be able to cast any light on that particular question. But I mean, the idea of authorship, that's something that we should really think seriously about, not just, I mean, we should think about whatever it was that this high water mark of faith in structuralism as cracking the code of some sort of natural law of human experience, what they thought about authorship, 
And then we should definitely think otherwise and think other ways about what the political circumstances, how storytelling and politics is, is connected. I mean, this is, um, you know, that, that's just, that's a really well-formed question. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next question is from Victoria Millen. Is there any similarity between Levi Strauss's Mythemes and the Arne Thompson Uther Folktale Index? Or, or is something like the ATU more interested in narrative similarities, whereas Mythemes are cultural units? So once again, like I'm, um, it's so nice to be able to plead ignorance. I just, I don't know about these particular things, but I'll bet if that folktale index was created bet any time between 1960 and 1980, that they were um, thinking with this broad movement of structuralism of which Levi-Strauss was a, a, a leading exponent. So they would know what mythemes were and somewhere they would probably say exactly how they, um, <laughs> how they were engaging with that particular point of reference. Um, we have another question from Amber Scarborough. How can we apply structuralism to colonialism, particularly the idea and application of the colonial language? How does this further apply to your ending notes on the psyche and brainwashing? So, yeah, fantastic. Uh, kind of, yeah, very so, good. I mean, this is like if you, so after you do your Levi Strauss section, then, then read Foucault. That's the thing where you get this sudden, the, the resurgence of this obsession with power as the missing piece of this idea that the universe has a code. And once we've cracked the code, you know, like leaving out the historical um, powers of human institutions is a huge problem. And so um, applying structuralism to colonialism will change structuralism. And um, I mean, that's kind of what, I think that's, you know, that's what we're doing nowadays. This ending notes on the psyche brainwashing thing. I mean, that's where I am right now. I've, I've, I've become really interested in this um, chilling mobilization of science for ostensibly objective technical uses that then show up in these insidious forms within police technologies. And I'm trying to think about that. And so the fact that, um, uh, Lawrence Ralph at Princeton has written extensively on John Burge and police torture and connected it to the black box. I mean, the, he's written uh, an, a paper called The Black Box about this, this chilling genealogy of the ontology of the enemy. There's a great piece about Norbert Wiener's um, wartime service uh, by, uh, by one of the science and technology guys. Um, so, I mean, I just, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't have a good answer because I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm thinking about it too much. <laughs> but it's a great question. All, I think all my answers are gonna be like this. Yeah. Um, so the next question is from Trish Lochran. Um, so you read structuralism as something that persists in materially meaningful and politically profound ways not as an epoch in the history of ideas that ends when Derrida gets up at Johns Hopkins and posits play to structure. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, an idea that heavy doesn't just go away when one person figures out another way to look at things. I think we're, you know, it's impossible to get away from computers and mathematics and and science and the DNA and, you know, atomic structure. I mean, structuralism works <laughs> at the level of phonology and at the level of, of genetics. So um, we can't, we, we need other tools to think about the meaningful qualitative experience of human life. But, um, but it, you know, the past doesn't pass. <laughs> we're just, we're, we're continually recuperating the debris sort of. <laughs> Um, this question from Sasha McDowell. You mentioned fan fiction as a sort of bricolage, yet often literature studies tends to disregard 
transformative works as derivative and unoriginal. Would you argue that there's actual worth significance in fan works, especially as extensions of myth themes? Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a, I, I identify strongly with the, con, with the tradition of cultural anthropology that's like everyday ordinary life is a site of cultural creativity that is the most important part of what it is to be human. I mean, I, I you know, the, the, the grand, the great works of art tradition is not all that. I mean, that's also interesting, but no, fan fiction is, is incredible. And we live fan fiction like we this <laughs> that's that's a model for 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 human being that's really compelling you know yeah. um we've just been through 13 questions <laughs> so i'm imagining jeff that that's um that's uh, that's a lot and i think is an indication of how much people have sort of responded to your talk and enjoyed it um, I just want to give another moment in case there's another last minute question coming sure. in. Um, the, the last, I gave this talk two years ago and I got some fantastic questions that really helped me mm -hmm. think more and change the talk a little bit and, and get great insights. So I, I mean, questions are the best part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think, I think, that's the lot for okay. the questions. And um, thank you so much. We loved having you here. And I'm sure um, you're going to hear more from people in the audience who will be emailing you afterwards. But thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who's joined us uh, for this lecture. And um, thanks especially to Jeff for thank giving you. this lecture. Thank you so much. Okay. So I'm, I'm